In this video, we're going to attempt to explain why this particular equation, uh, the angular velocity, or uh, what's, what's often known as the angular frequency of motion, is equal to the square root of k over m, where k is the spring constant, and m is uh, the mass that's being moved. In this diagram, we have a spring attached to a mass. Uh, the spring is attached to some wall on the other side, so that m is not moving. And the surface is frictionless. So if we pull that mass out a bit this way, so it's over here, the, string, the spring will try to pull it back, so the force is going to go in that direction. So the position can be taken as being positive, uh, say delta x, and the uh, force, of course, and therefore the acceleration on the spring, will be taken to be negative. Acceleration on the mass, sorry. So uh, let's write out our equation of motion, that is the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration, and that is equal to the spring constant times this x vector. Now, if we're going to get into our vector analysis, we need to understand, okay, uh, m a, whatever that acceleration is, we could write that in the x direction. Uh, is equal to k times this delta x. In fact, instead of writing delta x, let's just write it as x. We could take the zero of position as being x zero right there. And then here's a negative x hat vector. Why? Because that force is pulling in the negative x direction. Those unit vectors are going to cancel out. And what I'm going to be left with is that ma is equal to negative kx. So, uh, what's all that mean? Well, let's first look at this. A is equal to negative k over m times x. Uh, what that's saying is effectively that the acceleration goes in the negative direction as the x vector. Now, if we start it over here and we let it go, it's going to basically oscillate back and forth, okay? The, the motion of the spring will go back and forth around that x0 point. So one might uh, correctly assume that the x position uh, as a function of time looks like whatever your maximum extent is, we could call it, oh, we could call it delta x since that's what I've written there. Delta x, that maximum position you pull it out to, times cosine omega t. So uh, basically we're saying that there's some angular velocity, or angular, uh, yeah, angular velocity uh, times the, uh, the time. So that's going to go linearly, and this motion, of course, is going to oscillate back and forth. So what we're then saying is that the acceleration looks like negative k over m times that. In short, the acceleration will have a negative cosine dependence if the position has a positive cosine dependence. So let's write this out. So we would then write that x of t is equal to, say, that delta x times cosine omega t, as I did before. I'm just going to line this up here. And then we would say that the acceleration as a function of time looks like, well, from before, from before where? Well, when we were uh, looking at how harmonic motion, uh, accelerations in harmonic motion, relate to positions, we had something that looked like this. Uh, an omega squared times an amplitude, in this case delta x. We'll put our negative sign in from what we have here, and we're going to write our cosine omega t. So, now how does all this fit together with this equation? Let's see what we can put. We have m a plus k x equals zero from that equation. Let's fill in our values right here. So we have negative m omega squared delta x cosine omega t plus k delta x cosine omega t equals zero. Let's divide out 
stuff that divides out. So for example, the delta x cosine omega t's are going to all divide out. And so when that happens, we get a negative omega squared. There's an m there as well. Let's, well, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Plus k equals zero. Or omega squared equals k over m. In short, that angular frequency term comes from the equation of motion and a substitution of uh, one of these solutions, the fact that we have a sinusoidal dependence uh, of position and ultimately of uh, the acceleration. So then we know that the angular frequency or angular velocity is equal to the square root of k over m. As a side note, it means that if you have a spring, let's say that you're out in space, you're in a zero gravity environment, and you want to actually measure the mass of something. It turns out that you can measure the mass of something using this equation. Uh, m is equal to k over omega squared. So you put an object on a spring and you let it oscillate back and forth. You may remember that omega is equal to 2 pi over t. You get yourself a stopwatch and uh, that stop, use that stopwatch to measure the period of motion. So that thing is going to oscillate, you know, something like this, back and forth, and you measure maybe 10 periods of motion, divide by 10, and then you can very accurately determine this period here. So if you know that period, then you can get omega. If you know the spring constant of your spring, uh, you've got the other part, and then you can determine the mass. So as you can imagine then, masses that are more heavy will oscillate more slowly. Uh, which is to say, if t is greater, the, it takes more time to oscillate, the angular frequency is smaller, and a smaller angular frequency in the denominator, when squared, will give you a higher mass. And this is basically an illustration of Newton's law of inertia. Bigger masses take more energy, more force, to change their motion, and therefore uh, we will see that reflected in any kinds of oscillations.